Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Moore. Tom, how's it going? Well, Tony, it's Monday, and that can only mean one thing on the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. Yes, even in May. Tony, it's a Michigan Monday, and given the state of things around the Michigan program, and we'll get into all of the whys and all of the nuance around the state of things in the Michigan program, but given the state of the Michigan program, I'm sure this is going to be an episode that is going to be extremely well-received by Michigan fans. It's going to be very, the nuance will all be appreciated by Ohio State fans. I think, Tony, as always, we've set ourselves up to have a very, very well-received Very appreciated podcast. Everyone should just hit the thumbs up button now because I'm sure that's how you're going to feel later on. Yeah, this is wrapping up our listener questions from last week. This was, uh, we decided to set this one aside because we didn't want the ire and the anger to be washed away by further conversation. So this one is um, from a poster over on uh, the Buckeye Huddle message board, Out Hiking. The question is that we will be discussing what uh, what are your takes on Sharon Moore so far this offseason? Based on what he has done so far, do you think he is capable of keeping Michigan playing at a high level if they avoid crippling sanctions? And so uh, there's a number of different things we can talk about today, and I'm sure we will. But let's answer, uh, let's discuss the first question and, and what we think about what Sharon Moore has done so far this offseason. Because it's been a... A pretty pretty busy off season, and uh, what you would expect a new new head coach. You got to put together a staff. You got to, as any coach, you got to try to keep your players from leaving. You've got to try to replenish. You've got to try to recruit. So, overall, uh, kind of a busy January, February, March, and April. Yeah, definitely a very very busy time for Michigan since the end of the twenty twenty three season, and I think when you're looking at Sharon Moore there's a bunch of different factors that you've got to look at here. Cause the, the answer to, you know, how is he doing is his grade is incomplete. We'll have to see how it goes from here, but he was brought in obviously as a continuity hire. The whole point was, Hey, we're going to keep the band together. We're going to keep, you know, we're going to keep our staff together. We're going to just run it back next year. And it worked great in 2023 and sure Jim Harbaugh left and, you know, you're going to, he's going to take a guy or two, but, you know, we're going to run it back. And then there hasn't been as much continuity as you maybe expected. And with the lack of continuity and with losing a bunch of guys to the NFL, and we'll get to why some of those guys probably jumped to the NFL probably later when we talk about the crippling sanctions portion of this conversation. It just feels like there hasn't, you know, you would sort of expect, okay, the guy who was presented as this beloved offensive coordinator and this oh, deeply respected assistant. And, you know, certainly everyone's going to come back and the staff's going to want to come back for him and all the players are going to want to come back for him. And, oh boy, it's going to be, and it really has not been that way. And part of that has to do probably with Jim Harbaugh's departure and when Jim Harbaugh departed. And that is certainly part of it. And some of it has to do with, boy, they lost a lot of seniors off of last year's team, but, there has not been the immediate recruiting buzz that you would normally expect off of a national championship. They have not brought in a ton of talent through the portal. It's just kind of been, eh? And, you know, this is this is way too early to say the Sharon Moore era is a failure and Michigan is doomed to, you know, drop back to the depths of the, you know, the three, four loss seasons forever that they were mired in for quite a while. Way, 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 way too early to say that. But I mean, this hasn't been, this has not certainly brought the continuity that I think Michigan thought it was going to when they, when they hired him. I do like the fact that you mentioned, you say the phrase is the Sharon Moore era of complete failure. That way we can now put that as a title. Is the Sharon Moore era a complete failure? Uh, No, we're not going to do that. Not yet. The, um, it's, an impossible task to keep up the momentum from where Michigan had it with everything that is going on. We see it all the time. A team wins a championship and it's like, this is the perfect time to go out, whether it's a coach or the players, this is the perfect time to leave. I think back to Ohio state's national championship in 2014, which was done with 
so many second year guys. If those were third year guys, you would have seen so many of them leave because they were already, their minds were already in the NFL in 2015 because they had to come back. They couldn't go anywhere. And you saw what happened that year where, where they struggled at times and didn't live up to the hype because basically they were already in the NFL. They had moved on. You, you celebrate and you move on. Or you, um, you know, with Michigan's case, you get sanctions and you, <laughs> and you move on. But I, you know, we, we know Jim Harbaugh had been wanting to get back to the NFL and there was no better time in so many ways than after this season for Jim Harbaugh to get back to the NFL, which he did. And so there's, this is not a good runway for Sharon Moore. This is more of, um, you know, a mud line of uh, off-roading that you've got to try to get the plane going. And you look at what, what the offseason has been. He's, he's had two commitments in his uh, four months or so on the job. Illinois defensive lineman Nate Marshall, who was a top 100 guy. Michigan offensive lineman, who was a top 200 guy, recently committed. They've added a Youngstown State wide receiver out of the portal, C.J. Charleston, an Arkansas State kicker who looks like he's probably going to be the starter, who was 34-40 on field goals his last two years, and, and he started two years at Arkansas State. <clears throat> and then cornerback Marion Walker, who uh, they landed from Ole Miss, who they also gave to Ole Miss, who was um, a Michigan Wolverine last year, 6'3 corner, transferred to Ole Miss after the season, and then uh, came back to Michigan with uh, with with the departure of cornerback D.J. Waller, who was vying for a starting job, and there were a lot of expectations that he was going to be the number two or the number three corner. And so he surprised a lot of people when, when he left and, and hit the portal, so they had to do what they could to replace him try to find somebody opposite Will Johnson. I don't know that, that it's going to be Walker, but it, it's not a good situation to bring in guys from the portal because you have guys that are maybe this is their last stop, so they're looking for uh, either a starting spot or uh, uh, an opportunity to win a championship. What they're not looking for is NCAA sanctions looming over, a brand-new coaching staff. And, and when you look at the guys that they did get, C.J. Charleston, his former receivers coach is an analyst now with Michigan. So there's a connection there. Walker, there's obviously a connection there. So these are – Michigan is more of a known quantity to these guys. And so it's not not as much of a leap of faith. But really difficult to bring in guys in the portal. And, and as we saw, Tom, it wasn't a great spring. It hasn't been a great spring in terms of the – the amount of talent out there in the portal. No, it definitely hasn't. And I think there are probably several positions where Michigan was probably looking to bring someone in and hasn't or hasn't been able to yet bring someone yeah. in. One of those positions is quarterback where, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, poor mouth anyone, but I don't think that a quarterback room of Alex Orgy and Jack Tuttle and Davis Warren is overwhelming by any means in terms of talent. And I saw a prominent Michigan site sort of reviewing uh, the, the level of talent at all these different positions and the quarterbacks were all the absolute lowest level or the level above that. So that is not just us being haters. That's Alex Orgy, who's thrown, I believe, one pass in his Michigan career and Davis Warren, who's a former preferred walk on and Jack Tuttle, who's in, I think, his seventh season and has never really been a starter anywhere he's been. That's you know, yeah, that's three different options you have. And sure, Jaden Davis is there, but he's a true freshman. So if you're throwing a true freshman in there, he's Jaden Davis is a very talented player. If you're throwing a true freshman in there, that is going to be a rocky season probably when you're replacing basically your entire offense outside of Colston Loveland. So quarterback is one position where I think they probably would have loved to bring in a veteran quarterback. And sure, every team was probably looking to do that. And very few did because there were not as many guys in the portal as maybe you would have expected, especially after the spring. And then safety, too. Safety is the kind of, we'll see, you know, we'll see how this goes because Jaden Mangum, the Michigan State safety, is still in the portal and has been linked to Michigan. Boy, they would really love, they, they with the injury to Rod Moore, boy, they would really love to add a safety. I it, Mangum would certainly be, fit that bill because they lost Keon Saab to the, uh, to the, the portal. He went to Alabama. You lose more to an injury, and 
boy, that's a pretty big hole to fill in the back of the defense. It should be a pretty good defense overall. If they can add Mangum, that certainly fills one, you know, sort of big gaping hole potentially at the back of that defense. But it just, they have not added the kind of players they have in the past. And, you know, Tony, I know there was this, oh, Ohio State's buying a national championship by bringing in all these transfers. I mean, can I run down the list of transfers that Michigan brought in last year? Josh Wallace mm. started at corner. James Turner started at kicker. Josiah Stewart, edge rusher. Ladarius Henderson, offensive lineman. A.J. Barner, tight end. Miles Hinton, offensive lineman. Drake Nugent, offensive lineman. Ernest Hausman, linebacker. And Jack Tuttle. Those were those were the nine transfers they bought in brought in last year. Tony, uh, did they did they buy a championship? I don't I don't know. I mean, is that is that is that bad now? Because in you know bringing bringing back all the veteran players last year. I know it's bad now to do that. Was that bad last year when that was Michigan's plan, or have things changed? No, th yeah, things have definitely changed. Last year, that was a that was they did it. That was classy. This mm. what Ohio State has done has been it's not classy and it's gratuitous and frankly it's gross. The it's flaunting and I don't appreciate it. But you, know, you mentioned Jaden Davis. It's been twenty years, I believe, since Michigan started a true freshman quarterback, Chad Henney. Uh, that worked out. Um, spectacularly well uh, relatively uh, i'm not expecting that to happen this year I, i'm not going to be surprised if there are multiple quarterbacks that get starts for michigan this year however i am on the side of the of i think alex orgy is going to be okay and he can do enough to for them to do enough basically so i think they'll be okay and we're going to talk about him and and the Michigan offense many more times over the next uh, six, seven months. So uh, I, I do expect him to be okay. The question, obviously, is throwing the ball, the the accuracy, and you just don't know. And he, he could be very good, or he could just be good enough, or he could be not quite good enough, but he makes it up with his legs. Like JT Barrett so, could only so get them so clear, far. So just just to be clear, the the hmm. concern is that the quarterback might not be good enough throwing the ball. That's your that's your only concern. If that's your only concern, then I I rescind my earlier criticism and thought that they might want to have found someone in the portal. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, I was, but there was who was out there really, and you know. But the thing is, you you had to know in the winter that this was going on, but also. You had no coach. You had no, like, you had nothing going on. And I don't know that they really had the the NIL wherewithal, wherewithal at that point when there was just all kinds of chaos and everybody's waiting for Jim Harbaugh to do what he's doing and you get the NCAA. So just not a really good time for them to be shopping for a quarterback. So you'll you'll go in and and uh, with with Alex Orgy and everybody else, Jane Denegal, wh whomever else, and see how that goes. I think um, I think he's going to be okay, but I uh, I reserve the right to be wrong about that. the The other question, Tom, that is part that we want to discuss. So, is based on what Sharon Moore has done so far. Do you think he is capable of keeping Michigan playing at a high level if they avoid crippling sanctions? And let's we'll assume that they do avoid crippling sanctions. And for me, there is no reason to think that he can't do what every other Michigan head coach other than Rich Rodriguez has done. And whether it's because you look back and it's nine wins, it's 10 wins. And, and every now and again, you'll have like Lloyd Carr had a stretch. Um, Gary Moeller had a stretch where, you know, you've got three really good years. Jim Harbaugh had a stretch with three really good years. But also, I kind of think Rich Rod and, and Jim Harbaugh, these last three years, are maybe the outliers. So if you just wipe them out, I, there's no reason for me to think that he won't be uh, what those guys were. Everybody talks about him glowingly in the coaching you know, profession, and he was this high riser, high riser, and everybody likes him. So there's no reason for me to think that he won't be productive at Michigan. But we need to have a conversation about why Michigan was where they have been of late. But your thoughts on, on that portion of Sharon Moore keeping uh, Michigan where they are. Well, where, where they are as of 
five months ago, I don't think he's going to keep them there. Where they have been historically over the last 20 years, by and large, yeah, I think he can keep them in a 10 and 2, 9 and 3 kind of range year in and year out. I don't think 15 and 0 is probably going to become a habit based on what we've seen so far. It is certainly way, way, way too soon to look at Sharon Moore and say, this is not going to work out. It's possible it doesn't work out. The recruiting hasn't been great yet, but it's May, and they had a weird transition period after Harbaugh, and they have some looming stuff from the NCAA. And, you know, we can, we can he- you know, frame this around like, well, let's just say they don't get crippling sanctions. I mean, okay, we, we can say that. Tony, lots of people have been saying that, but... Then lots of people have been saying cheeseburgers, et cetera, and then they got three years of probation for mm-hmm. that, and their head coach wasn't cooperating with the NCAA, which is setting up far more serious punishments down the line. So, you know, I can't say that they won't get crippling sanctions. In fact, I would say that I'm – let's say that I'm thinking it's more likely than not that these sanctions will be substantial if and when this all happens. And just to remind you, the Connor Stallions, yada, yada, yada – is all in the NCAA investigation phase right now. So when is the NCAA going to issue their notice of allegations? We do not know that. The speculation has been late spring, early summer. We'll see. We have, you know, it it could come out tomorrow. It could come out in August. It could come out in November. We don't know. The NCAA has supposedly fast-tracked the investigation, but they have to put out a notice of allegations next, and then Michigan gets 90 days to respond, and then the NCAA will issue a punishment at some point after that, probably a period of a few months after that. So this is all sort of still looming. And, you know, when you looked at the cheeseburgers, et cetera, punishment, there was not a lot of, see, we told you so from the people that were saying this is a nothing burger. So the burger turned out to be a something burger and maybe a fairly substantial burger in terms of setting up what could be coming next from the NCAA. So That's sort of important context here, and that's going to shade a lot of what the Sharon Moore era looks like, because if they get some kind of a substantial multi-year punishment, that's going to really make his life a lot more difficult. If it turns out to really not be anything, well, then I think he'll probably do just fine. We'll see how that shakes out when that shakes out. So the last three years, Michigan finished in the top 10 of the AP poll. The first time they had done that three years in a row since 1989, actually since 1990, 91, and 92. And the, the 1990 team, I went back and looked. The 1990 team went into their bowl game with Ole Miss ranked 12th, and they won 35-3, to and they jumped up to 7. So they, a bowl game win there gets them into the, uh, the top 10 three years in a row, or it leads to it. And if they hadn't done it then, you got to go back to like, 76, 77, 78, something like that, where they had three years in a row finishing in the top 10. So this is very much an outlier for Michigan. So it's not fair to expect, or not maybe not even realistic, to expect Sharon Moore to keep them there. I, I, I wonder with the advent of the, the playoffs being more more teams getting in, could you see, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's obvious, I think it's harder now than it, to finish with the, uh, to finish, uh, like to jump five spots in the postseason, because you can do it by playing a an Ole Miss team that I think was like ranked fifteenth. Whereas now, if you want to jump jump five spots in in a final poll, you're going to have to beat probably a, a couple of really good teams. So it's going to be harder now. But um, with with these last three years, Tom finishing in the top ten. And winning a national title, making the playoffs all three years, beating Ohio State three years in a row. Let's talk about some comments from outgoing Ohio State Athletic Director Gene Smith, who was on a a radio show in Columbus, public radio, a show called All Sides with Hannah Staver. And he was asked if uh, those wins over Ohio State, if there should be an asterisk there. If you thought there should be an asterisk. And here's the quote uh, from, uh, I got this from 24-7 Sports or National Desk. Of course I do. The rules are in place to protect the integrity of the game and try your best to create a level playing field. And then 
And when those rules are violated, then it affects those principles. So we have to keep that in perspective, but I'm not one that looks back. I think what's important for us is to look forward. We host that team up north this fall, and I'm assuming it will be what it's always been. And so that came out uh, maybe about a week or so ago, like four or five days ago, I saw it pop up and then you know other outlets picked it up as well. I saw a, a credentialed Michigan reporter like quote tweet it talking about just further evidence of Ohio State being a soft program. That tweet was eventually deleted, but it's it, it became a big thing or at least a talking point. And Michigan fans do not like the this being brought up and and and, and not just the the asterisk thing. They don't like the the cheating being brought up, and you can't ignore it. It has happened, and it's still being dealt with and. We'll figure out what all of that, what what comes of it. But you can't act like it didn't happen. You can't act like it didn't have an impact. Now, Tom, I do remember, I, I do remember Connor Stallions being eliminated from the program and Michigan going on to win eight games, including a national title. That happened. But a whole bunch of other things happened as well. They, you know, two and a half seasons, I, you know, hey, cheating over three years, the Big Ten had to warn opponents. Hey, just so you know, this is going on. Like that is unprecedented. And, and so you can't just ignore it. Uh, you, you can't just laugh it off. I see that a lot with Michigan fans and, and some members of the media just laughing it off. Ah, cheating, cheating, cheating. But it, it, it's a thing that happened and to ignore it is, is silly. And it's maybe just a, a testament to the world we live in now. Lastly, I'll say here, Tom, is when, uh, as as I can hear Michigan fans right now saying, cope harder, cope harder, cope harder. That phrase, that response, cope harder, is a giant coping mechanism, just an FYI. Yeah, I don't know if th that has kind of replaced rent free in your head mm. as kind of the brainless, uh, you know, immediate reflexive response to anything. You know, I don't know. I think that that's a function of, well, you can't say it didn't happen because, I mean, a bunch of other Big Ten teams quite literally have the receipts on, you know, hey, this was this was all happening and there's video and, you know, so you can't say that. And you can't really say, well, you know, this is this was nothing that this had this provided no. Well, sorry, let me rephrase that. You could say that, but it would be pretty obvious that you were a moron if you said that this had no competitive advantage because, as you said, the Big Ten took it as this is a unprecedented thing. They take an unprecedented step to warn these teams in the middle of the season that this is going on. They take the unprecedented step of punishing a coach before any of this stuff, you know, before the investigation has been finalized based on what they found already. You know, the Big Ten is taking this very seriously. The NCAA by fast-tracking the investigation, is showing that they're taking it pretty seriously. Jim Harbaugh was uncooperative with the other mm -hmm. investigation. Uh, I'm sure, Tony, he's racing back from Los Angeles to uh, be extremely cooperative with this investigation. The NCAA has rules about if your head coach is not cooperative, that these things get treated very... Like, that will make your punishment more severe. You've already seen that with the you know, small nothing burgers, small potatoes, cheeseburgers, et cetera thing. What, what do you think is going to happen here? So, you know, that's that's one piece of this. As far as the Gene Smith thing, I, I mean, whatever. He got asked the question, like, what's he, what's he going to say? Like, no, the, the, I don't think anything of the last three years was was tainted in any way by this scandal, which the Big Ten and the NCAA all seem to be taking as extremely serious. Like, what what do, you, what do you think he's going to say? He didn't volunteer that information. He got asked the question. That's what he's going to say. That that to me is, you know, Tony, when you delete a tweet, it's always a sign that you've done a really good tweet. That's, uh, you know, a good, well thought out tweet. Um, you know, like, I get it. Like, you're trying to throw red meat to the fan base and the mm -hmm. fan base is probably looking for anything to grasp onto at this point. I, I get it. But that's probably not going to be. That's not one that's going to age well, put it that way. But, you know, there's Tony, I think there's been a lot over the last ooh, 
eight months or mm. so that's probably not going to age well when all is said and done. I did have some alumni and Buckeye fans reach out to me saying, why couldn't Gene Smith say this last year? To which, you know, it, it would have created uh, a bunch more uh, chaos and, you know, Ryan Day has to then deal with that and answer those questions as well. But if you feel so strongly about it, why didn't you say this last year? Why do you wait until you're, I know why you wait until you're out of office essentially, <laughs> but it, that, that this, uh, this industry protects itself so, so well while you're inside it, like coaches will talk about, I can't believe all these players are being bought. And it's like, well, name names. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to call anybody out specifically just overall, just so you understand what we're dealing with. But you know, you won't name names while you're basically going to meetings with everybody. Well, yeah, everyone's everyone's tampering with all of our players. Oh, like who? Oh, well, I couldn't possibly say. And this is yeah, this is not exactly a new thing in college sports. If he had done if he if Gene Smith had said that last fall, it would have just made it, it wouldn't have changed anything. It would not have mm -hmm. materially impacted anything other than, you know, making making Gene Smith the story, which, you know, college athletics administrators are generally and coaches are generally not trying to make themselves the story because then you have to deal with the fallout of whatever you said. And then your coaches have to deal with it. Coaches don't want to deal with that stuff. Like coaches, coaches want to coach. Coaches want to do as little media stuff as they have to. And they want to do, you know, be able to do it in as vague a way as possible. You think Ryan Day wanted to get up and have to either say, you know, I disagree with my boss or, <laughs> uh, yeah, here's my, here's my thing that, uh, here's my opinion that, uh, these two things, you know, th these two previous losses, they shouldn't count. Like what would the response to that have been? Like th that's just a asking Gene Smith to say anything about that last fall is just, I don't understand how the media cycle works basically and how the media business works. And I, I certainly understand fans wanting that, but really like, no, that, you don't say anything. You just, you do exactly what Ryan Day did and you just don't say anything. And, you know, last fall, anytime Ryan Day was asked about it, we're like, we put it up. Like Ryan Day is asked mm -hmm. about the Michigan thing and he didn't say anything, but everyone's clicking on it. Cause it's like, well, what is Ryan Day going to say? Even when Ryan Day says nothing, you had people saying, oh, well, he knows that it's, see, he, if he thought it was, it was a real big thing, then he would say something like, you, you handle it the way you have to handle it. I thought they handled it completely fine. And I think Gene Smith handled it completely fine by not saying something last year. And this year, like I said, you, you got to ask the question. And so what are you going to say? Like, yeah, that's, you know, the, you're, you're now at the point where it's not a ongoing, like the building is actively blowing up kind of situation. So now you can maybe take a little bit of a step back and take a little bit of a perspective. And then, you know, if Gene Smith was going to be the Ohio State Athletic Director next year? Would, does he give that interview? Probably not. Does he give that quote? Almost certainly not. So, you know, I mean, all, all of that is context that I think is worth noting here. Yeah, kind of one for the road, parting shot on the way out. Tom, you were cordial and, and a friendly acquaintance of a former Michigan Athletic Director and Bo Scheinbeckler. Mm -hmm. say, say Bo, say Ohio State has been accused of cheating, and Bo, as you knew him, but is still the athletic director. Do you think he says something in season like that? Well, so I knew Bo, and I didn't know Bo incredibly well. I We've talked about this on the show before, mm. but I used to work at the ABC station in Detroit, and they would, on uh, Friday mornings, Bo would come in and tape the Big Ten ticket TV show. It was like the pregame show for Michigan, Michigan State that aired on Saturday mornings. They would tape it on Friday mornings. Uh, he and Don Shane, the great, legendary, wonderful, wonderful human being, uh, former Channel 7 sports director up there. And so I would just go over and shoot the breeze with Bo for five minutes in the newsroom, 10 minutes in the newsroom every Friday. Just, you know, he knew I was an Ohio State graduate. And so we'd talk Buckeyes and Wolverines and Big Ten and whatever. And, you know, I was there when Ohio State did the, remember the 2004 pregame they brought out the bomb sniffing dogs. Do you remember that, Tony? Mm -hmm. When Michigan mm -hmm. got to Ohio Stadium, and it just sort of delayed, de it delayed the uh, Michigan team arrival because they got there and they're unloading the buses or whatever it was, and then 
they brought out the you know the security dogs and they're sniffing the bags and all that kind of stuff. Bo thought that was one of the biggest shams in history. He thought that was outrageous. It was, and you know, if you go back and read Bo's books, Bo is Bo is a very moralistic person. Like he had, you know, you read you read you know his probably ghost written autobiography from the whatever 1980s or whatever it was. He has real strong stances on steroids. He has very strong stances on paying players, all that kind of stuff. You know, would would the bow as presented there or the bow as, you know, was angry about the 2004 dogs at Ohio Stadium thing, would that bow have tolerated a Connor Stallions prog, you know, program if that was going on when he was there? I mean, as presented in the book and as presented to me during the 2004 Ohio State Michigan thing i don't think bo would have really appreciated the connor science thing as you know if he was as he presented himself to be and i have no reason to believe he wasn't i don't think that would have necessarily gone gone over real well with bo if you're having a really organized you know rule breaking uh thing like the connor science thing was so you know I, would he would have would he have said that in season i have no idea I just, I, I think based on, you know, again, my very limited interactions with him mm. and what I know about him from, you know, the publicly available information and conversations with him, I can't imagine he would have been a real big fan of the Connor Stallions thing. And I can assure you, if Woody had a Connor Stallions on his team, oh boy, would that not have gone over real well. So, you know, that that's, there were, there were examples of that in the 70s where Barry Switzer had a guy pretending to paint the stadium at the University of Texas. I think it was during Fred Akers. It might have been Daryl Roy, but I think it was during the Fred Akers era at Texas. And Texas ran a fake punt or something like that that they had never shown before. And like the Oklahoma players are calling it out and Texas lost the game and was incredibly mad. I, I would imagine that if Ohio State had done, you know, something like that to Bo, Bo would have been pretty outraged. So I would assume that Bo would probably not have done that to to Woody. And so we're talking about counter stallions in this question because it's a large chunk of the track record of Jim Harbaugh. And when we're trying to figure out and, and discuss Ken Sharon more, do keep things where they are. You, you can't ignore counter stallions and the possible likely impact he had Tom, the, uh, the 35 games while counter stallions was on the sidelines uh, from 2021 until he was, until he resigned after he was fired, the margin of victory under uh, in the Counter Stallions era was 24 points per game for Michigan in those 35 games. The 35 games before Counter Stallions, the margin of victory for Michigan was eight points. So your margin of victory triples under uh, with this one guy on the sidelines. And then, of course, um, he moves on. And the, the margin of victory when he was gone, these last eight games for Michigan, it was 19 points. But, you know, featured Michigan's only three games decided by a score last year and a fourth decided by nine points. That was the Penn State game. So things got a little bit more difficult, but the schedule got more difficult, so you understand it. Michigan, uh, they won it all. And uh, that that happened. I, I I can't say they won't. You can't take that away from them. We'll see. But it's part of the story, and it's part of can can Sharon Moore keep Michigan where they are? And the thing is, like, how did Jim Harbaugh get them there? And there, this is a connected thing. Connor Stallions and Jim Harbaugh is a connected thing. And if you don't think it is. You're lying to yourself. Now, could Michigan have won it all without Connor Stallions last year? Yeah, I think they would have. They very well could have and probably would have. But there's two years before that as well. And so there's a track record. There is a a um, a history there, and it happened. And there's there's proof, and there's this, and there's that. And we'll find – maybe one day we'll figure out what happened with the, the Central Michigan sideline. Uh, or, or maybe not. But I also, Tom, don't think that the uh, Michigan fans can just point at the, well, they beat Ohio State last year without Connor Stallions. And it's like, yes, Michigan's Jim Harbaugh's best team ever. 
beat Ryan Day's perhaps worst team ever at home by six points you know, in the final minutes of the game. I don't think that actually makes the point you're trying to make. Well, I think the question there is if the offensive lineman doesn't step on Kyle McCord's foot and then Kyle McCord completes the pass to Marvin Harrison and Marvin Harrison catches it and runs into the end zone, does that mean that everything about Connor Stallions was immediately proven 100% correct? Because I understand that you know, well, this agrees with what I feel. So therefore it's definitely the, it is the only truth. It is the, the only possible truth that exists in the universe. I don't think I can definitively say this is exactly how much the Connor Stallions thing helped Michigan over that three year span. Now, the data certainly suggests, well, there's a strong correlation between the Connor Stallions thing and Michigan being substantially better, historically anomal anomalously better than they have been at virtually any point during their program history, at least over the last 30, 40 mm -hmm. years. So there's a strong correlation there. Can I say that it was the only thing? No, it, it was certainly not the only thing. Can I say that it played a significant role? I can't say that with 100% certainty. I think it played a significant role to, you know, a fairly significant role. Was that, you know, 10% of what happened? Was that 30% of what happened? I, I don't know. And, but, you can't say, no, 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 no. That's just a coincidence. They just, they had their three best teams and that happened to be when he was there, but it had nothing to do with it. If it had nothing to do with it, you wouldn't have had him standing next to your coordinators ever on the sideline at every game. And, you know, if there was no value there, there would be, you know, they, they would have acted very differently. Like this is, this is one of these watch what they do, not what they say kind of situations. They showed you exactly how important they thought it was. So, you know, how much of an asterisk does that put? And, you know, does does the asterisk not apply to the second half of 2023? I mean, let's see what the NCAA ends up deciding when this is all said and done. Because the NCAA absolutely could vacate the wins from all three seasons. They could vacate the wins from just the games before Connor Stallions was there and not vacate the national championship. I'm sure the NCAA would love to not vacate, you know, the national championship game that's really not a great look for an organization, and I'm sure they would get all sorts of pushback on that. But we'll see what they do. I'm suspecting, I, I suspect, Tony, that it's going to be substantial whenever it does come down. It just, this is one of these things where you can't possibly know with 100% certainty this is exactly how important this was, and this is exactly what would have happened in the counterfactual where Connor Stallions is never born, and, you know, the 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 world goes on, you know, and and... You know, was that enough to get Michigan just barely over the hump uh, last year or to make them a, an attractive transfer destination for players who maybe would not have transferred there otherwise? The fact that they had beaten Ohio State the previous two years and gotten to the college football playoff? Uh, maybe. I don't know. It's a, it's a possibility. This is just, you know, this is one of these things where people are going to argue about it forever. But I don't think, you know, just as I don't think Ohio State fans can say, like, absolutely, there's no chance Michigan wins the national championship if not for the Connor Stallions thing. I also don't think Michigan fans can say, absolutely, they would have won the national championship without Connor Stallions. Like, I don't think you can be real, real definitive. There was an impact there, and it's just kind of what, how big was that impact? We don't really know. Yeah. They blew everybody out with, with Connor Stallions, but. The margins were so large, it's like, well, they were they were vastly superior than everybody, everybody they played last year with Steiner, Connor Steins on the sideline. They were still going to be vastly superior without him. And like I said, they probably win it anyway. Now, you know, bounces can, can happen here and there, and, and things can change if you, if you do it over again. And, and I think um, you know, they didn't need to do that last year, or, and I say they, it, it didn't need to be done, whoever did it, and... and um, maybe it did the, the years before that, but like you said, it, it could have created something else or, or lured somebody in. Um, but again, this is, this is a, an examination of can Sharon Moore keep Michigan where they are. And that depends. And I, I don't know that Jim Harbaugh was going to be able to keep them where they were because we don't know how much of a factor counter stallions had in this, but the fact that it was going on and that he was doing it lends you to believe that it was a positive impact but how, how much you know whatever um 
but you can't say it had no impact. You can't dismiss it. You can't laugh it off. It, it happened. And so I, it's done now. So now what is the impact without him? Tom, before we go, like, I think Michigan's going to be an underdog right now. And I think three games this year, Texas at home, um, Oregon at home, and then at Ohio state. If Michigan is where they need to be in terms of a Sharon Moore has them where they are a, a not a national title contender, but a legitimate power, like they need to win all nine games that are not toss ups. Like you need to prove that that you know, you don't trip up at Illinois coming off of a bye week or at Washington. You need to win all of the games that you're supposed to. And then we'll see what happens with the games that are that, that you're not supposed to win. First, first do no harm, Tom. Yeah, this I think this is a year. I don't know what their over under is for the season. Is it nine and a half? Eight and a half? What Eight and a half it? or nine and a half. Yeah, it's it's what yes, it's one of those. Uh and you know, I feel like that nine wins is kind of where if you're nine and three, you're probably at least in the college football playoff conversation. And that's probably a pretty decent year for Michigan this year, depending on you know, what, what is the Oregon score? What is the Ohio State score? What is the Texas score? Do you lose by a field goal? Do you lose by 17? That's Those are two different kind of conversations. If you lose those three games by three, you're probably in the college football playoff. If you lose by three touchdowns, well, then you're probably not. And if they go eight and four this year, that's a rough first year. And then, you know, it's kind of unfair to a first year head coach, but then you're immediately going to have people going, listen, this guy took over a team that was a defending national championship and, you know, champion and fell flat on his face. This guy is a Larry Coker. This guy, you know, this is going to be a disaster. This is going to be, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think that's necessarily fair. He's kind of in a bad spot this year because he's got a tough schedule and he got handed the team in kind of a rough, uh, you know, a rough way because Jim Harbaugh kind of hosed them on the way out of town in a couple different ways. The looming NCAA sanctions is a whole separate conversation. But if they go eight and four this year, I think, boy, I have, you know, fair or not, I think the narrative around him is going to be, boy, the, you know, this might be a problem. If they go nine and three and they're in the college football playoff conversation, sure. I, I think that's probably fine unless they get smoked in those three games. I think this is the interesting question, Tony. Let's say Sharon Moore is the head coach for Michigan for the next four years, maybe beyond, maybe not. We'll see. Next four years, how many of those four years does Michigan make the college football playoff field? Well, uh, and I will just say the win total is nine and a half for Michigan. Um, Under. How many of those years? Like, I think they've got a a fair chance to do it this year, but it also depends on how many of those years is nine and three going to get you in, you know, and we don't necessarily know that. Um, wh what is an acceptable number? Because – at Ohio State, the acceptable number of four years is four, you know, and for Sharon Moore, um, feels like two is okay. Am I? Is that is that crazy? I don't think that's crazy. If you know, some of that may depend on is he two and two against Ohio State and makes the college football playoff twice. If he is, then he's you know, then they're probably Michigan fans are probably more or less fine with it. You know, you're going to have the people who are you know the national championship or death kind of people. But, you know, I think for the bulk of the fan base, if they split the next two against the uh, next four against Ohio state and they make the playoff twice, that's probably fine for the most part. That's not going to get you fired. I don't think. I think two is the number I had in my head. Four seems very unlikely. I I'm trying to decide if one or three is more likely after that. And, you know, one thing that factors in here is, they have Texas at home this year, then they have a home and home with Oklahoma, and then they have to go to Texas in 2027. So you, you've you got a tough non-conference game each of those years, which you've got a little more margin for error, so that's okay. And if you win those, that's a big, you know, that's a big feather in your cap. And I don't know how great Oklahoma really is, but it's certainly going to be, you know, you're not playing UConn and Hawaii and directional Michigan anymore. You've got, you have an actual challenging non-conference game, so that's going to, that's going to be part of it. You always finish with Ohio State. You don't necessarily have, uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge to get into the Big Ten championship game because you've got so many other teams that are kind of playoff level teams that are in the conference now and you can only get two in. So two to two feels like the most likely number to me. 
I just, I'm really kind of torn w- with are one is, you know, is one of the next four or three of the next four more likely? I think I'm going to say three, but I'm really not. I, I feel like there's a big drop off after two in my mind. Well, and the Big Ten is more difficult now or will be moving forward. And I, I will also note that prior to these last three years, the last time Michigan finished in the top 10 two years in a row, was 2002 and 2003. And you're essentially going to need to be to be safe. You'd be in that top 10. And it's not something that Michigan does on an annual basis until recently. So I think historically, one would be more likely than three over those four years. But right now, the way you can build teams and keep teams and build upon teams, I think I would go with three over one. But yeah, two was the first number that really bounced into my mind, just because I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be some difficult times. They're only going to make the playoffs two out of four years. I, boy, you know, Purdue would love that, right? Um, but I, I think two is a good number, and then I would go three, um, one, zero. Uh, what, what is, uh, is, is zero more likely than four? Or is, I, I think four is more likely than zero. Which, because I don't, four, th- yeah, you've got to make it once in, in four years. Yeah, they're going to make it once in four years. Just because I, you know, I think virtually every significant program is going to make it once in four years. You know, Penn State's going to make it once in four years. Oregon's going to make it once in four years. Ohio State's going to make it once in four years. Probably Washington. You know, I, I'm a little down on USC right now, but USC, pro, you know, they're, they're probably going to make it at some point. You're going to have any prominent SEC program is going to make it once in every four years. You know, I think the, your dividing line is basically like Ole Miss. If Ole Miss or Texas A&M, mm-hmm. somewhere in that range, if you're north of that, you know, if you're on the happy side of that line, you're going to make it. If you're not, you're going to miss it, but you're going to have one year where you're close. It just, and Michigan should certainly be north of that line, I would think. So, yeah, they're going to, they're going to make it once, probably make it twice, and then, you know, Beyond that, we'll see. But, you know, this is, this is as with everything we're talking about with Sharon Moore, it's probably a little too early to have a, a real firm referendum on this because he has not, as I said earlier, he got a rough transition from Jim Harbaugh. Did not, that was not a well-timed transition. Lost a bunch of guys. And you don't know what the NCAA is going to do. And nobody knows what the NCAA is going to do, but the NCAA feels like they have given you a hint at what they're going to do. And it feels like it's going to be more on the substantial side than on the less substantial side. So, you know, how is that going to impact things? Well, it depends on what, exactly how substantial the potentially substantial thing is. Yeah. And what, uh, what new rules are coming about, about uh, roster limits and things like that. Cause if there are scholarship sanctions, then you just ask your NIL collectives for, for, for more and, you know, get, get some walk-ons in there if you can. It's not something that has really been implemented very well and very strongly over uh, throughout the nation. But it's a it's a theory that is out there that you know you can go to a hundred scholarship players. You just pay fifteen guys, and uh, we still haven't seen that happen yet. But if if you're down like say three or four or five a year because of sanctions, that feels like maybe something you can you can get together with some car dealerships and uh, you look. You can sponsor our walk-ons that are four stars and. Um, you know, so we'll see, but I do want to, for, for the Michigan fans that listened and watched and have struggled through the mentions of Connor Stallions, I do appreciate that. Now, uh, the, the comments I'm sure are just tremendous. And uh, if uh, you would like to go ahead and throw us a thumbs up on this video, that would be fantastic. Um, and of course you can find us at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That's Ohio State fans. That is that are Michigan fans. If you want to join. Now is a fantastic time to do it. We are still running our spring sale on an annual subscription at a, at a reduced rate for now. So if you want to grab that, please do so. So thank you all for tuning in. Ohio State fans, Michigan fans, all of you. And we will talk to you guys later.